It is so wonderful to look around the room and see so many of our community and educational partners. The Sherwood Foundation has been a very proud supporter of OYAS for the past four years and we're so honored to support the 10th anniversary of Cumbre. We have so many wonderful Latino leaders, leaders who are extremely engaged and working hard to improve the community conditions for vulnerable families. The Sherwood Foundation is engaged in much of the work around education, voter rights, and cultural diversity. About four years ago, um, with the help of uh, Lourdes and Jonathan, uh, the Sherwood Foundation partnered with the Omaha Community Foundation to create um, the uh, uh, Futuro Latino Fund. We wanted to see Latino leadership making key decisions about where philanthropic dollars could and should be invested. While many important programs have been supported through the fund, I have to tell you that I've been a little bit surprised about how few of the applications have been directly focused on social justice and human services. In fact, we've had a hard time giving away all of the funds that we have in that fund. Maybe Lourdes and Jonathan will be sad that I have shared that this publicly, but there's more. And I know that, that philanthropy absolutely cannot just throw money at issues, and that is not what I am advocating. I share this because Omaha's philanthropists want to support the Latino and Mexican community, and the truth is we don't always know how. We need people like you to come together to collectively identify and then partner with government and philanthropy to strategically address the issues. We need to be led by the grassroots and the grass tops to the right answers and to the partnerships that will truly help families increase their stability. It is critical that we not only look to individual programs to address community need, often these are needed band-aids on the wounds that are created by economic and social injustice, but we absolutely must find ways to move through community dialogue to active and coordinated efforts to create the systemic changes that will eliminate the need for programmatic band-aids in the first place. My call to you today is to use the keynote presentation as an inspiration toward collective action for systems change. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you one of the nation's thought leaders on education reform, diversity, and the achievement gap. Trained as an urban sociologist, Dr. Pedro Nogueira speaks clearly about how social, political, and economic conditions in our cities and towns limit educational opportunities for Latino and African American youth. Noguera is the Peter L. Agnew Professor of Education at New York University, the Executive Director of the Metropolitan Center for Urban Education, and the Co-Director of the Institute for the Study of Globalization and Education in Metropolitan Settings. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pedro Noguera. It's okay. Buenas tardes. It, it is such a pleasure and an honor to be invited to Oyas for your 10th cumbre. And uh, I want to thank Lourdes and, and all the other organizers for inviting me. I'm not offended at all that I was the second choice. She said after Sonia Sotomayor, I would have <laughs> preferred her myself. So. Um, I, I'm really delighted to be here and delighted that all of you are here. And I uh, really want to uh, say I appreciate the work that OYES is doing in asserting the presence uh, of Latinos in this area and giving voice uh, to its interests, to its needs, to its aspirations. And uh, pleased to be part of this gathering. Uh, <clears throat> education, as we know, is so critical to our future. Uh, and how we educate our children uh, in many ways will determine what kind of nation we become. Uh, increasingly, we're often hearing policymakers say that education is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. We hear that from President Obama. We hear that regularly from Secretary Duncan and many, many others. Unfortunately, they never elaborate 
beyond that, and what that really means. Um, because if we actually were to think about it, we would recognize that if it is indeed the civil rights issue of the 21st century, we're in trouble. Because our schools are fundamentally flawed at preparing our children. And all the indicators show us that. And part of that is because we haven't yet addressed the civil rights issue of the 20th century, which was racial segregation. <laughs> and increasingly, we find that we have schools that are not only segregated on the basis of race, but of class as well. And so I want to spend some time with you this afternoon looking at what it would take to create schools that succeed in educating all of our children well, including the fastest growing population in this country, which are Latinos. And I want to do that by drawing your attention to the fact that education is unique in America because it is the only right we have until healthcare, and healthcare, as we know, is still working itself out very much. It's the only right we have that is an entitlement. All of our other rights in this country are framed largely in negative terms. You have the right to free speech, but you don't get the ability to express that free speech through a newspaper or radio, unless you own one. But you have the right if you can figure out a way to do it. You have the right to freedom of religion, but no guarantee that you will have a place to worship. You have a right to bear arms, and fortunately, we don't go around arming people. So our rights don't necessarily guarantee us anything except for protections that others can't take them away. And that's important. I want to not deny the significance of that. But education is different because education actually gives you something. It gives you the right to go to school. And what's important about that is all children in this country, all children, including the undocumented, including the homeless, including children whose parents are incarcerated or who are in foster care, all children have the right to a public education in America. And the courts have repeatedly ruled that that right is guaranteed. And ironically, it's a right that's not mentioned in the US Constitution. It's mentioned in state constitutions, but not in the US Constitution, but it has become a fundamental right. However, we also know that our educational system reflects our society and all of its inequities. And so the kind of education you have access to is fundamentally different if you are a poor child or a wealthy child. We are one of few countries in the world that actually, by policy, gives the most in the way of per pupil spending to the children who have the most and the least to the children who need the most. And so our schools reflect our inequities, and not surprisingly, those are reflected in the outcomes of our children. And by now, we should know that it's going to take more than a good slogan to change that. And I would say that much of what we've gotten from policy over the last several years are good slogans, like no child left behind. Good slogan, isn't it? Except we're still leaving lots of children behind. And what's more is that slogan did not come from the Bush administration. It came from the Children's Defense Fund. But when Marion Wright Edelman came up with the slogan, leave no child behind, she had something else in mind. She was thinking about nutrition and health and welfare. Not that we should test the children as frequently as possible. But unfortunately, that's what it's become. And so we find ourselves needing education because education is implicated in all of the most serious social problems facing this country, whether we're talking about poverty or unemployment or crime, and it's also implicated in the solutions. And so the question is, how do we ensure that education will, in fact, be part of the solution to creating a more just and equitable society? So I want to start by taking you back in history and reminding you of why education has always been important in this country and why it was that this country, before other industrialized nations decided we would create public schools, public schools that would educate all children on the vision that we needed an institution 
that would be the equalizer of opportunity, because that's the vision that's guided American education. And one of the main reasons for that was because we believed we needed an institution that would help us to integrate immigrants from all over the world, whether they were coming from Europe or Asia or Latin America or Africa, we have looked to our schools to teach children English, to teach them the customs of the society, to make them Americans. Alex de Tocqueville, the French philosopher, writing in the 1830s to a colleague back in France, has said, imagine, if you will, a country made up of people from all over the world with different cultures and languages. What will hold these people together? Well, the answer has always been the schools. That's what will hold them together. And we've looked to the schools to create an integrated society. And not surprisingly, our schools have often struggled with that task. But nonetheless, it is a critical role. And we've looked to our schools not only to integrate our schools, but to dismantle our own version of apartheid. And as we know, that took not only a Supreme Court ruling, but it took federal troops being deployed by a Republican president to Little Rock, Arkansas, to require that all children, including those who had been segregated on the basis of race, to have access to public education. And we know that education has been the forefront of expanding democracy and rights, not just on the basis of race, for women, for disabled, for language minorities. That is, in almost every category, we start by expanding access to education, and that sets precedent for breaking down other barriers. And so public education plays an important role in American society, critical role. And as I said, even now, as we can point to the failings of our schools, and we've got to look closely at those, the fact remains that in many of our communities, our public schools are all that remains of the social safety net for children. Because even in schools where children don't learn to read very well or don't graduate in large numbers, our children are still guaranteed in school a meal, sometimes two, heat in the winter, and adult supervision, and if they're lucky even, maybe access to a school nurse although that access is recently denied in Philadelphia because they decided to fire all the nurses. And just two weeks ago, a girl died of an asthma attack that could have been prevented had there been a nurse on site. But I want you to keep that in mind because I think it is very easy to attack this system for its failings and not remember how important it's been to our society, particularly now, as poverty is increasing. We have the highest rates of poverty in the advanced, amongst advanced industrialized countries, and they're growing, particularly amongst children. One out of five children in America is poor. And in many of our cities, the rates are much higher than that. And we know that when children are poor, that also means that they don't get regular access to health care, so they use emergency rooms for chronic illnesses, and they suffer from a lack of food, so when I was in Michigan just a few weeks ago, I met principals who described sending food home with children on Fridays to ensure that they will eat over the weekend. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know hungry children don't do so well in school. And children who have trouble reading might sometimes need eyeglasses, but no provision for eyeglasses under No Child Left Behind. We have a very narrow vision of what it means to educate our children. And because of that narrow vision, what we find is that those who come to school with the greatest needs and the most disadvantages are the ones who invariably are doing least well academically. The simple fact of the matter is this. Our schools cannot solve our society's problems by themselves. We pretend they can. We pretend that the teacher can be a social worker, a counselor, a psychologist, that she can solve all the problems and, and that the schoolhouse can be held responsible because what we do now is we use accountability as a means to judge schools when we know very well that many of these schools don't even have the resources 
to respond to the basic needs of our children. And to show you how cruel this has become, we now pretend that you can simply threaten a school and pressure a school into improvement, even though there's absolutely no evidence that that works. State of Florida, under former Governor Bush, Jeb Bush that is, decided they would put letter grades on schools to let everyone know if it was an A school all the way down to an F school. Now, I would think that if the state of Florida decided to put an F on the school, it should not allow children to go there. Because they, they know that the school is not prepared to educate the children. It'd be like if you knew that this building was condemned, but the university said, have a nice meeting there and enjoy lunch. That'd be irresponsible, wouldn't it? So I visit Edison High School in Miami. It's a triple F school. And I asked the principal, how do you get to be a triple F? And he said, you simply failed the state exam three years in a row. I said, what, what happens if you fail again? He said, well, we will fail again. Because 80% of our children don't speak English. But they're required after one year in the country to take an exam in English. And so we will fail yet again, and we'll be a quadruple F school. I said, well, what happens next? He says, well, the state will, says they'll take us over. And then I ask, are you worried about being taken over? And he says, not at all. I said, why not? He said, because there are too many schools just like us all over Florida, failing schools. State can't take us over. He said, what's more? He said, do you think the state of Florida would know what to do if they took over this school? Do you think there's some secret recipe they've been holding back on for Edison High School? I also learned that that principal was going to quit his job at the end of the year. And you should know everyone I met described him as committed, dedicated, hardworking, but he was tired, tired of being beaten down. We are not doing the work required to educate this generation of children. And accountability is not a strategy for improvement. It's not to say that we should not focus on outcomes. We absolutely have to focus on learning outcomes. But we also have to focus on inputs and whether or not we provide schools with the resources and supports they need to meet the needs of the children they serve. And all you have to do is look at the schools that are struggling, and you will see very clearly that we're not. Right now, the number one challenge facing this country is poverty and its cousin, inequality. That's the number one challenge. And all the data, all the evidence shows that as inequality grows, the challenges get more severe. But we should also know this. Inequality is something we can do something about. It is not inevitable. It has only gotten worse in the last 20 years as our economy has gotten more skewed. But we should know this, that as that continues, our problems become more and more severe. The problems outside of school influence what happens inside of school. And unless we have a means to tackle those issues, we will find that our schools will continue to fail, that dropout rates will remain high, that large numbers of people will be unemployed and unemployable. Because even as jobs grow, for those who have skills and education, we will lack the people, so we will continue to recruit them from other parts of the world. Which means they will continue to have large numbers of people in this country trapped in poverty. And so we have a major challenge on our hand because we don't seem to recognize that this gap, this achievement gap that we claim that we're so concerned about closing is nothing more than a manifestation of social inequality. We've known for many years now that the strongest predictor for how well a child will do in school, for how well they'll do in college, for how well they'll do in the SAT or the ACT, is how much money the family earns. And if you combine how much money the family earns with how much education the mother had, because the mother is typically the first teacher, you can predict how well a child will do in school with great consistency. Now let me add, though, that that's not because poor children can't learn. We have absolutely no evidence at all that poverty is a learning disability. However, when poverty is ignored, and we ignore the basic needs of children, we should not be surprised that they do not flourish in school. 
but policies today ignore those basic needs. And so consequently, when we see the rates, uh, 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 the performance of schools and the rankings of schools released, are we surprised to see which schools are at the bottom? We shouldn't be, because it's almost always those who have the least that are at the bottom. And when you concentrate those schools into certain, those children into certain schools, invariably what we'll see is those schools fail. Again, because it's a reflection of unmet needs. The disparities, I said, are growing, and what's important to keep in mind is there's a correspondence between gaps in wealth and gaps in education, gaps in health and gaps in education. And what this suggests is that we need a more concerted strategy because as we see incomes widen, the gaps in incomes widen, we're also seeing gaps in educational outcomes widen. And for Latinos, this poses a serious problem because Latinos are the fastest growing segment of American society today. You should tell those people you know who are thinking about retirement that they should become the strongest advocates for ensuring that Latino children get educated because their retirements depend upon it. In 1964, there were 28 workers to one retiree. Today, there are three workers to one retiree. Economists project that if it gets to 2.8 workers, Social Security collapses. That's how far we are away from it. But as you can see from this data, even as the population rises for Latinos, the gaps in attainment also remain, and they're largest for Latinos. And so we face a huge challenge because here we have this burgeoning population because it's not immigration that's growing the Latino population, it's natural reproduction. And the Latino population is younger than any other group in the society. And it's also interesting to note that Latinos are more likely than any other group to be employed. More likely than African Americans or white Americans to be employed and also more likely to be stuck permanently in low wage jobs. Trapped. Because they don't have the education and the skill and if you don't have legal status then even further trapped. And so we find ourselves both needing to ensure that the future generation is educated, but not doing anything to ensure that will happen. And so the graduation gaps are still very much intact, despite no child behind and now, despite race for the top. Why? Because neither of those policies aim at addressing the root of the problem. Talk to Secretary Duncan about this. He thinks that No Child Left Behind had a branding problem. That they just needed a new slogan. So they said, race for the top. But the problem is bigger than that. Much bigger than that. And if you think that you're going to solve this simply through new accountability measures, then you don't understand the nature of the problem at hand. And unfortunately, I think that our policymakers don't understand that this achievement gap is a multi-layered problem, not just about how well you do on a test. It's about the fact that we're not preparing children from the time they're born for school. So we have a preparation gap because we don't provide universal access to preschool. And we have an allocation gap because we don't fund schools equitably. And we have a tremendous opportunity gap because many of our kids don't have access to an enriched education. They have an education that is increasingly narrow and not enriched. I go to schools today throughout this country where I see art taken out of the curriculum. Why? Because art is not on the test. Music taken out because music's not on the test. Some states you see science being taken away because science is not on the test. Recess, definitely not on the test. Phys ed, at a time when obesity is our number one health challenge for children, phys ed, recess, taken away. So a study that said that eating lunch was good for test scores, and I said, thank God. Otherwise, they might take lunch too. <laughs> when again, we know that our children need lunch, they need recess, they need art, they need music, they need science, they need history, they need math, they need a well-rounded education. 
but our policies are not designed to ensure that that is what they receive. And let's be clear about this. Middle class children are getting that well-rounded education. It's poor children in America who are getting this narrowed curriculum that increasingly looks like little more than test preparation. And so we have a tremendous problem in our hands because we know that as poverty grows and our schools become more overwhelmed, failure increases. But the problem is not simply an educational problem. It's a political problem. First and foremost, it's a political problem because our policymakers don't understand what it is that we're dealing with. In fact, we have policymakers who openly say, as we've seen from Secretary Duncan and others, that the real issue is not poverty. It's about the lack of accountability. And so they continue down the same track. And we continue to see failure. Not only do we see failure, we see whole systems like Philadelphia and Detroit now in full free fall with classrooms of 40 children staffed by completely inexperienced and overwhelmed teachers. And so we have a tremendous problem on our hands. And so I would say with our job and your job as members of this community here in Omaha is to challenge the notion that all we have to do is increase accountability through more testing because there's absolutely no evidence that that's going to get us where we need to go. The real question is how do we break the cycle of poverty? The real question is how do we create schools that can be more successful at meeting the needs of children? That's what we should be focused on. And the good news is there are schools out there in America that are showing us it can be done. And I get to visit those schools in all kinds of communities, schools that serve immigrant children, schools that serve undocumented children, schools that serve homeless children that are successful. And the existence of those schools is all the proof you need to know the problem is not the children. Let me say that again. The problem is not the children. The problem is the way we treat the children. The problem is our inability to create the conditions that would allow our children to learn, develop, and thrive. That's the problem. There was an important study done at the University of Chicago just a couple years ago. Studied 10 years of school reform in Chicago. And Chicago was important because Secretary Duncan was the superintendent of Chicago at that time. So we had a hand in what was happening there. And the study asked the question, why is it that certain schools improved and other schools did not improve? What was wrong? And the research found, well, there are five essential ingredients that had to be in place, and that when those ingredients were there, all five, schools experienced sustained improvement. And when you look at that list of items, what you'll see is none of them are really things that should surprise you. Like there has to be a plan to provide guidance to teachers so that teachers actually get support. And there has to be ongoing efforts to create a culture for learning and strong leadership and parent and community involvement. These are not things that we didn't know before. But when you look at schools that are struggling, when you look at the schools that the US Department of Education has called the dropout factories, what you find is those ingredients aren't there. And simply pressuring those schools is not a strategy to improve them. Now, we have another strategy out there. It's called community schools. And it's been around for a long time. And they're working. And what's the idea? The idea is that if you actually bring services into schools, like clinics and social workers, and some way to serve those other needs that schools can become more successful because then the teachers can focus on the learning instead of being expected to do so much more. And the most celebrated of these is the Harlem Children's Zone, which gets lots of attention because Jeffrey Canada has done such a, an amazing job serving 6,000 children in central Harlem, showing that when we do make a concerted effort to address all of those needs, 
And I would add, it doesn't just mean health and parent education and preschool. It includes those things, but it also includes music lessons. Right? Because they want to provide an enriched education to those children that the kids can do extremely well. And a lot of people look at that and say, well, but look, it costs so much money to do what Jeffrey Cannon has done. And it's true. He's raised tons of money, and he has on his board of directors Goldman Sachs and hedge fund operators. And so people say, how can we do that? Well, guess what? There are other schools that are doing it with less. Schools started by the Children's Aid Society showing, guess what? If we can coordinate the services in our community, we can together have a greater impact on outcomes for our children. We pretend that we are impoverished. We are still a wealthy nation. The resources are there. What's not there is a plan to strategically bring them together. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma last year, engaged in a meeting with a big community group like this, all focused on how to build a social safety net for children. That's what they were talking about in Tulsa. That included preschool for every child, after school programs for every child, enriched summer programs for every child, health services for every child. And what was amazing about that, it was Republicans and Democrats in the room all together problem solving about how to do this for our kids. And you know what? Oklahoma has more children in preschool than any other state in the United States. And I asked the governor, how, how come Oklahoma stands out there? Because I was actually shocked, because I didn't expect Oklahoma to be such a place. I just know about them for football, but <laughs> lo and behold, they're good at preschool too. And he said, well, we saw the research. Research shows preschool is very helpful. And I said, well, I'm glad you saw that research. You should share it with your other governors because they don't seem to know that. There's another approach, and it is an approach that requires that we think more holistically about our children. It also requires that we think about what we're preparing our children for in terms of careers and opportunity. I helped to start this initiative in the East Bay of California, a partnership between seven high schools, five community colleges, seven biotech firms, and one four-year school. It is now 20 years old. Young people graduate from high school and into jobs in the biotech industry, now paying $20 an hour. And those who decide they don't want to do biotech now have the background. They can decide they can study medicine if they want to because they've taken four years of science and four years of math. This is not about narrowing options. It's about expanding them. But it's also about addressing the concrete need many kids have to earn a living at a field that will promise increased opportunity over time. Where are the jobs for the future in Omaha? What are you doing to ensure that children here will be connected to those opportunities and that the education they provided right now is aligned and, in fact, enabling them to take advantage of those opportunities? It doesn't just happen. It takes real work to think it through. And when it happens, and when we really start to shift the conversation away from using assessment as a means to rank and monitor kids, and instead begin to use assessment as a tool to diagnose learning needs. Education changes. And there are schools right now that are using assessment that way that are much more focused on delivering high quality teaching to kids and much more focused on enlisting, uh, enlisting the natural curiosity of kids so that kids become motivated as learners. Schools that develop that curiosity in schools where kids start to understand that knowledge is power. So they become invested as learners. And when that happens, schools become a really different kind of place. Because rather than kids saying the first thing out of their mouth that school is boring, they describe what they're learning and the passions it's cultivated, and they become people who are much more invested as learners throughout their lives. We have an impoverished view of education. We need to expand that view. 
to give our kids an enriched education that shows them the languages they speak are actually an advantage because we need children who are bilingual and trilingual and multilingual. That's an asset. <laughs> and a benefit for this country. And we need children who understand that if what they're learning in school has real relevance, they can actually become problem solvers because they will have to solve problems that the previous generation leaves behind. And so we need to think differently about what we're doing to excite kids about learning. Schools like this one, Hollenbeck Middle School in East Los Angeles. Look at these children. This is a math class. And to show you how good that teacher is, she's not hovering over those children, she's talking to me. And before that, she was working one-on-one -on -one with some children because she is the facilitator of learning. The children are in control. Why? Because they are self-disciplined. Because they've learned how to work in groups. Because they've learned how to cooperate. Because they've learned how to learn from each other. And when that happens, they're not looking at the clock for what time to get out of class. They're so engrossed in what they're doing, they're disturbed by the bell. That's a math class. And you don't see one child doing all the work while the others copy. Everyone understands they have a role, and everyone understands they have a part. And they're deeply engaged. And those children are lucky because when they graduate from Hollenbeck, they get to go to Garfield. I know I met someone here who went to Garfield. <laughs> well, Garfield is where that crazy Bolivian, Jaime Escalante, taught. And he believed that children from East Los Angeles, the children who were the children of factory workers and custodians could do advanced placement calculus. He died two years ago. And when he died, there was his funeral and there was this great outpouring of his former students who were now engineers and doctors and lawyers and judges, all because of one teacher. I met one of his students, she's now an assistant superintendent in Inglewood. She said, described how he would push her and encourage her. She said he used to show up at her soccer games. I said, he would come to your soccer games? Yeah. She said, but he didn't come to encourage me. He would ridicule me from the sidelines. <laughs> Tell me I was no good at soccer. I need to give it up and go back to math. <laughs> you know, after he got these results in Garfield, they started to send in researchers. First, they thought he was cheating. So they required the children to be retested. And when they did well again, they sent in the, the researchers to say, okay, what's he doing? What's this man? What's his special technique? And the researchers came away and said, we don't see anything special about what he's doing here. Because they didn't understand what ganas means or what it is. That's what he was imparting in his children. He'd tell these children, you are the descendants of people who built pyramids. Calculus is in your heritage. And he would take them to aeronautical plants. He said, this is where you use calculus, because he wanted to expand their horizons for what they thought was possible. And by doing that, he got them to work hard. That was his secret. <laughs> getting them to work hard, getting them to work on Saturdays, getting them to stay late. What are we doing to inspire our children and get them to understand the value of education? Hollenbeck Middle School is still doing it. They're doing it in Sacramento with a group called Youth Speaks because they figured out, you know, all these children that want to be rappers? You know, rap is a great way to teach literacy. Have you ever met children who've memorized the lyrics to hundreds of songs? I meet them all the time. What does that tell you about their capacity to retain information? They've discovered at UC Davis that you can use rap as a way to get kids writing. And as you get kids writing, they start to overcome that initial hesitation, that initial sense that they have no voice. And you see these children writing about their lives and now starting to realize that they have a power of expression that had not been developed. And that's happening in the poorest communities in Sacramento and in surrounding areas. It could happen in Omaha, too. There's no reason why it couldn't. Because again, the problem is not the children. The problem is our narrow, limited vision. It's happening right now in South Africa, in the townships of South Africa, some of the poorest communities I've ever been in. I was in the townships outside of Port Elizabeth. 80% unemployment, 
Over 50% of the children are orphans. Parents have died of AIDS. And I discovered this school, Sapphire Roads Elementary School, a thriving school. And I asked the principal, how do you get this school to be so good? He said, well, the government wasn't helping me. So I had to turn to the parents. He has over 80 parents a day who volunteer at his school. They run the nursing clinic, even though no one's a nurse. I said, well, what happens if a child gets sick? He said, we just give them water and rub their belly. It usually works. Let them lay down. They, they grow food so food children are eating. They fix the desk. They clean the bathrooms. They volunteer in the classrooms. They draw on the resources and strengths of the community to support the school. It's a thriving school. And that man with the glasses on there, he's the principal, Bruce Dammons. And I said, Bruce, what an amazing school you've created. He said, I, don't, I didn't do it. The parents did it. I work for them. They have a different notion of accountability. He said, I'm accountable to them. When I was there, he was leading a protest with his parents against the Ministry of Education. I said, the United States, you would never see a principal leading a protest. He said, listen, if I didn't do it, they'd be protesting me. So I'm going to be with them. <laughs> That's social capital at work. So if you could do that in those kinds of conditions, you could do that in Omaha. What's holding us back? What's keeping us from creating schools where kids are excited about learning? What's keeping us from creating schools where children are challenged and stimulated? I've been part of a group for several years now that's been advocating we did a different policy approach. Then we need to focus on things like extended learning time and health care for children and preschool for children. Because if you ignore those kinds of things, you're not going to see a change in outcomes. We started in 2008 because we thought that with a new president coming, we might be able to convince the new administration to take a different path. But no sooner had we launched our initiative than another group came forward. This one led by Joe Klein, the former chancellor of New York City, and the Reverend Al Sharpton, and Newt Gingrich, the former speaker, and an odd collection, we thought. And what they say, they said, don't listen to those guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Standards and accountability. And what was interesting is Secretary Duncan signed our initiative, but he also signed theirs. And that's what they're doing. They continue down the same path. So I think we're going to have to push in our communities for a different kind of vision. And I would say it has to be a bottom-up vision. You can't wait to elect the right person. You've got to make it happen. You've got to insist on it. And it's got to be a vision that's holistic and comprehensive, that focuses on health and nutrition, focuses on teaching and learning, focuses on safety and mentorship, focuses on engaging parents, because all of those are critical to changing outcomes for children. And if we can create schools that function like that, we can begin to see different outcomes. Because I'm seeing that happen right now in the country. I'm seeing schools like Brockton High School in Massachusetts. Amazing place. 4,000 students at that school. The largest high school in Massachusetts. And we know that if Massachusetts were a state, Massachusetts would be one of the highest performing countries in the world today. Well, how did Brockton High School get to be so good? They did something radical. They decided they had to teach their children to read. That is, instead of, they were, they were, they were faced with the prospect that the state was going to implement its high stakes exams. And some people said, well, we're going to have to do more test preparation. And the teacher said, no, 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 no. The problem here is that these children can't read at grade level. That's the problem. And they went to the principal and said, we're going to have to teach other teachers to teach children to read. And the principal said, well, that's a good idea, but I don't know how to make them do it. She said, we will do it for our colleagues. We'll train them on our own time, after school, lunchtime. And they started working on it. And in 2002, when the first exams were given, 60% of the kids passed, which was a breakthrough because it was projected that 50% would fail and be denied scholarships, uh, denied diplomas. So more, children, more of the teachers said, well, this literacy is working. Let's, 
Let's all get on board. So now you have art teachers, science teachers, phys ed teachers, all teaching literacy. 2006, 80% of the kids passed. By 2012, 98% of the students passed. One third of the senior class qualified for a full scholarship to a public university because it got the highest possible score. Look at the picture. One third of those students are African American. One third of those students are Latino. The other third, low income white students. They didn't change who they serve, they changed how they serve them. If you can do that in Brockton, you can do that in Omaha. If you can do what she's doing, what Sadie Silva is doing, oops, sorry, it's not coming through. PS28. Sorry, we have uh, very generic names for schools in New York City. That's Public School 28. And if you saw the whole picture, you would see a picture of uh, Sadie Silva, the principal of the school. That school had the highest gains in literacy and math in 2012 in all of Brooklyn. And what you know is 40% of her students are homeless. 40%. She invited me to visit her school. She said, Pedro, please come visit my school. I finally get out there, it's way out in Brooklyn in a neighborhood better known for producing boxers like Mike Tyson and rappers like Biggie Smalls. And I get there, she introduced me to her secretary, she said, I want you to meet the person who runs the school. She does all the administrative work at this school. I said, well, what do you do? She said, I'm the lead teacher. She said, come, let's go into classrooms. And we go into classrooms, and the first thing I'm shocked to see is every classroom has four and five adults in it. I said, well, where'd you get all these teachers? She said, they're not all teachers. I said, that one's the teacher, that one's the special ed teacher, because they work together. All of our special ed children are in the classrooms with the others. No one can tell who's special ed, who's not. They plan together, they work together, because 30% of the students qualify for special education. At one point during a class, I see a little boy raise his hand. Teacher just looks at him and nods. He gets up out of his seat to go to the bathroom. I'm curious, because in some schools, going to the bathroom is a big issue. But he goes right to the bathroom, comes right back, back on task. I said, wow, that's impressive. She said, why? I said, well, in some schools, you know, you have to have a monitor, you have to have surveillance. She laughed. She said, if my children can't use the bathroom properly, I've failed as a principal. My kids have to walk on the most dangerous streets in New York City every day. She said, let me show you my professional development for my teachers. She takes me to a room where there are two social workers working with a group of teachers on how to respond to the social and emotional needs of children. One teacher says, I have a child with attachment issues. He's attached to my leg and I can't teach. <laughs> another one says, I have a child who's aggressive. He's fighting with other children. Another one has a child who's depressed and another one with anxiety. And I'm listening to the conversation as the social workers offer suggestions for what to do with the children. And I say to the principal, what made you decide to offer this as a form of training for your teachers? She said, well, until I did, they were sending too many kids to special education. So my teachers have to be more skilled to work here and we have to have more help. So she's built partnerships with the YMCA. The YMCA works with the school so the school can stay open every night till six o'clock. The shelter doesn't open till six and she doesn't want her kids out in the cold. And because they're there, the kids get art and music and robotics and chess and swimming lessons on Thursdays because again, she wants to provide an enriched learning environment for her kids. And there are classes for parents at the school who want to get their GED and parents who want to learn English and parents who are getting training to become nurses aides or security guards. She believes that if the parents are educated and employed, they'll do a better job with their children. That's part of her vision. So let me take you to meet my guidance counselor. And before we get there, she's have to warn you, this man I got from the rubber room. Now in New York City we have this place they call the rubber room where they put teachers who are written up and they could be in there for years sometimes. They don't work with children, they just sit there doing crossword puzzles, getting paid. I said, how do you know to get this man from the rubber room? She said, well, I don't know why he was there, but he was my guidance counselor when I was in school. And he saved my life, so I knew he was good. So I requested him, they said, you could have him. And I go in there and he's there with a the little boy and they're talking very casually and I introduce myself to him and the boy and I asked the little boy, why are you here today? He says, well, I'm here to learn how to be good. I said, is it working? 
He said, I hope so, because I'm tired of being put out of class all the time. And then they explained they have a no suspension policy at the school. No child is suspended. They don't believe sending children home to watch television is an effective form of discipline. They really do focus on teaching the child how to be good, how to deal with their own behavior. So I tell her, look, I'm very impressed by what you're doing, Sadie. I'm going to write to the chancellor and let him know about what's happening here. She says, OK, if you're going to write to the chancellor, I've got to show you one more thing. And she said, come to my office. We go to our office, and our office is set up like a classroom. I said, what happens here? She said, I told you I was the lead teacher. I'm working with children all day long. Then she shows me that she's monitoring every single student in the school. They know exactly where they are. They know who needs help and what kind of help they're getting. And they have portfolios with samples of their work. So a parent comes in to ask, how's my child doing? They can let them know exactly how that child is doing. Nothing is left to chance. And she writes, and she tells me, she says, please tell the chancellor what's happening. And I say, I will. So I tell the chancellor, so you need to go visit PS28 and see what's happening at this school under these very challenging conditions. And he goes two days later. And he's also impressed. So he writes about it to every principal in New York City. That's 1,700 principals we have in New York City. Except he only mentions one thing, the data system she had that she was using. Because New York City had just spent $100 million on that data system, and he was happy to see someone using it. So I write back to him. I said, I'm glad you went to the school, but you missed it. Because it takes more than a data system to get those kind of outcomes for those children. And that's what we're missing here, is that narrow vision is what's guiding our policies. And even when we see examples of success, like the ones I've described, they don't understand what it takes to build success. What it takes to build success is what's happening right now in Toronto, where despite their crack smoking mayor, they have <laughs> done more. They have done more to educate children in poverty and, and turn around schools for children in poverty than any city in North America. It's a different vision. It's a vision about meeting needs. When the Ministry of Education comes in, they don't come in to, to threaten them. They come in to say, how can we help? What do you need? It's a different strategy, and it works. It's a strategy you could use right here in Omaha to educate your children if you have the will to make it happen. We certainly have the interest. Because right now, the, as we know, the population is changing. By 2041, this will be a nation where the minority is the majority. It's already the case right now in Omaha Public Schools, isn't it? It's already the case in nine states in this country. That's our future. What are we doing to prepare for that future? We shouldn't be afraid of it. We should embrace it and recognize that even those children right now who are in this country Illegally, the dreamers are part of our future, too. And we can't allow these children to live in shadows. We've got to find ways to educate them and make sure they can continue to contribute to their families and to the society because our future is at stake. So my challenge to you here in Omaha, do you love your children as much as you love those corn huskers? <laughs> Do you really love the children of Omaha? Are you willing to create the schools they need and deserve? We don't have to wait for permission to do this. We can make it happen right now. You have brought together a community of scholars and activists who understand the urgency. Now what we need to do is organize ourselves to make this work happen for our children. We have a lot at stake, a lot at stake. Let me describe one more school before I close. I was asked by yet another principal in the Bronx to visit her school. And this is a part of the Bronx that burned in the 1970s. Burned because a lot of the landlords decided it was better to burn their property than to fix it up. David knows the area on Willis Avenue. My grandmother lived in the housing products right there on Willis Avenue. And all the children from PS 138 come from that housing projects and go to that school. So when I heard there was a high-performing school in that neighborhood, I said, I got to see it. Hard to believe, because that neighborhood is better known for drug dealers and gangs than for high-performing schools. So I get to the school, and I'm greeted by a little girl. She's fourth grader. She says, I'm your tour guide. 
And she says, let me show you, first of all, all the awards that we've won. And she shows me articles that have been written in awards. It's a blue ribbon school from the state of New York, recognized for their key accomplishments. Takes me to the library, she says, we have a competition every week to which classroom reads the most books. And at the end of the month, that classroom gets, a, gets pizza. Books now, not parts of books, not excerpts from books. And I'm struck because in the hall, there's work by students on the walls, there's artwork, it's beautiful, it's immaculate. Again, in this very, very difficult neighborhood. I said, well, this is a lovely school, I'm so impressed. She said, well, let me take you upstairs. So it's more impressive. So I'm wondering what I'm going to see upstairs. And I find out the only museum in New York City dedicated to the history of the Bronx is in their school. But it's not locked away in a closet, it's in the hallways. And the first thing you see is a picture of the Bronx family. A German family spelled their name with a K. Owned a large farm in that area. See a picture of Joe Lewis when he fought Max Schmeling. See a picture of the Yankees in the 1920s when Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig were on the same team. See a, the first album produced by the jazz artist Donald Byrd who lived in that neighborhood. And on display are all kinds of memorabilia from the 20s and 30s and it's all within easy reach of children. So the first thing that comes to my mind is that this could easily be vandalized, it could be broken, it could be stolen. So I say to the little girl, aren't they worried that this could be damaged or taken? And the little girl looks at me like I'm some kind of sicko. <laughs> and she says, I don't know about you and what kind of schools you go to normally. <laughs> so, but the kids at this school value this school. We, we appreciate, we take care of it. Why do I ask the question? Because I'm so accustomed to going to schools now, they look like prisons. Schools where their children are treated like little inmates being prepared for prison. We need a different vision of what it means to educate our children. What's your vision here in Omaha? Can you do the work? Can, can you work with groups like Oyas to create this vision, to energize this community? If you want to see this community transform, view this university, educate this next generation of children, we're going to have to ensure they go to schools that are preparing them for those opportunities. So I encourage you, do the work. And don't wait. Don't wait till we elect the right person. Make it happen now. Thank you. Is that a hand? Yes. Okay. I think they can, they can and should play a role. Um, there's a lot that we need to do that we don't have the public dollars to support. So, you know, I described Tulsa. The effort to build those systems, the preschool, the after school, was being led by an oil company and their foundation. And I. Good. <laughs> I'm glad to see they're investing like that in our children. So yes, I would say we need to engage private corporations and businesses in this work to support us in this, in this effort. Absolutely. Yes. How are charter schools? Uh, your, your research and the information you presented today is focused on the role of public schools, but there is uh, an increasing debate about the role that charter schools play, play in the improvement of education, and sometimes they are pivoted against public schools as a better alternative. Sure. Uh, you know, charter schools is a, they're a mixed, mixed bag, right? And um, I could take you to several charter schools right now in New York City that are some of the best performing schools in the state of New York that are serving poor Latino, African American children. At the same time, what concerns me about charter schools is that we've created a competition that's increasingly unfair, so the public schools are not learning from the charter schools, and what's more, many of the charter schools are not serving the most disadvantaged children, which makes the job of the public schools that much more difficult. So you're in a unique place in Nebraska because you don't have charter schools. 
if you do pass legislation, I know you've got a couple senators here, so maybe they'll think about this. It, you get a chance to really use charters as a laboratory for innovation right? and ensure that they will become, in a more cooperative way, a resource for the community and for, for other schools. The big advantage that charter schools have is they get to choose their teachers. They get to be freed from a lot of the public regulations, which a lot of times limit schools. And I think that that ability creates the opportunity to be more innovative. And uh, so I support it, but I do think we have to make sure that they are not denying access to our most needy children. So. Great presentation. Thank I work you. with the Omaha Public Schools, a mere school district that does have a K-12 dual language program, and we have some students here that are in that dual language program, and we partner with UNO in the preparation of our dual language teachers. I'm curious, as you travel the country, are you seeing other school districts I mean, my vision, our vision, would be to actually have a, the whole school district be a dual language school district. And I guess I would like to have some wisdom, <laughs> words that I can take back to my superintendent and my school board about how we could possibly make here in the Omaha Public Schools a school-wide dual language uh, district. So uh, I, I, I want to encourage you. I was, we, were, we were talking earlier about the importance of having good research to support that work. So before you go district-wide, I would want to make sure you do some good research to understand what is the impact on all kinds of children. Um, if the outcomes, I'm a big proponent, and the research out there, you know, the problem in education is it's all about implementation. If it's done right, if the teachers are well-trained, if the children get the support, it's very successful. However, if we don't do it right, you can find that certain children are also further left behind. So it's all a question of quality and implementation. So I would say before you go district-wide, get the research so that you understand what it's going to take to replicate it in other schools. What kind of training will teachers need? What kind of supports will children need? And just as a follow-up, there's research from Virginia Collier and Lee Thomas out of the former, retired from George Mason University of eight million student records. And what's powerful about dual language is that they can show you that it's been it's better for African American students, for special education That's students, right. for poor white kids, for obviously for our, our Hispanic Latino community. Plus, the advantage of preparing for the global world marketplace to have two languages and then three and four, I think we'll better prepare our students. And you're right, going district wide is not going to happen immediately. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is, uh, what we'd like to do is actually, you know, expand it to more schools in a very systematic way. And um, you're right, implementation is what it's about. That's the key. And I would say, again, the, the Canadians have figured it out a long time ago. They've been doing dual language for a long time, and it's very effective. So I think there's good reason to, to, to see this as, a, as a, one strategy that could be very helpful. But again, I think being strategic is going to be important. My question is, how did you get started in this? I'm <laughs> Okay. So uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So I am uh, um, the product of immigrants, father from Venezuela, mother from Jamaica. I was born in New York City. What you should know, though, is neither of my parents graduated from high school. Okay. But they believed strongly in the importance of education. This sent all six of us to college, my brothers and sisters. Uh, early on, when I went to college, I was, I was not really sure what I wanted to study. Um, I, I did end up studying sociology and history. But I was drawn to education because of the pressing practical problems I saw. And uh, initially, I, I, I resisted the, I got my teacher credential, and I did teach for a little while, but I resisted because I was, I was studying the Caribbean and Latin America, and I was doing politics, actually, in the, in the Caribbean. And then I was drawn because of what I saw happening to so many young people. This was in the early 90s when we had a big problem with youth violence in the area where I lived in, in California. And that led me back into education because I started to realize that if we were going to solve that problem, we had to create schools that could better serve that population. So that actually is what got me started doing that work to create that East Bay um, Biotech Academy that I described earlier. Um, it was all about problem solving because I knew uh, I was working with a school that was serving young people who were uh, overaged, and uh, who were, had been a lot, uh, out, out of school for long periods of time, many of them with criminal records. And the, the question that kept driving me is how do we convince these young people to stay in school? 
And spending time with the young people, I realized that the critical issue for them was survival. They had to figure out how to support themselves simultaneously. And so then I said, okay, let's look around the community. And in that community, there was this German firm, Bayer Laboratories, which is owned by, they produce Bayer aspirin, among other things. And I knew the city was negotiating with them for the right to expand the operations. And I went to the CEO of the corporation and said, why don't you create a biotech academy for our school? And because they're a German firm, and in Germany they use apprenticeships as a way to get young people into technical fields, he said, let's do it. And so what I've, I, I increasingly found education as, as an area where you could begin to solve some of those intractable social problems out there, and that's what's kept me in it. And you know, I often say that um, I, I am a pragmatic optimist. Right? <laughs> I am pragmatic because I understand fully how entrenched some of these problems are, but I'm optimistic because I get to go to the schools that I've described and see what can happen when you bring good teachers and children together with support from communities and parents, um, even under difficult conditions. So that's why I stay in this field. It's one up here. <laughs> Well, I think that's an important, it's a big question, right? Because I spent a lot of time on, that's one of the reasons why I support charter schools. Because when, when you give educators a chance to organize themselves around a common vision, they can do great things. I've seen that happen repeatedly. And a lot of times, charter schools give them the freedom to do that, to organize the day, to organize themselves. Um, and so I would agree, yes. But at the same time, empowering teachers also has to start on the assumption that they understand how to serve the children. And when you have big differences in race and class and language and culture, there's a lot of work that has to go on to ensure that those teachers understand how, that they have to be in alliance and solidarity with that community. And um, it's, you know, so unfortunately, I mean, I can name schools that are succeeding, I can name so many more that are failing, right? Uh, where, where what's happening in school is distressing and, 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 and disturbing. And, and so I would say that yes, empowering teachers is part of the solution, but you need a lot of other things to happen with communities to create those kinds of powerful schools. So it's really about communities and, and educators working together to meet children's needs. I think there's a hand over. And there's one here and then we'll get that one. No, you can go, you have the mic. <laughs> What I have seen that works best, and then the question earlier, the first question was about the partnerships, is when there's a real partnership with industry and education, then those apprenticeships can work better, right? Because then the industry is much more invested in that, in that young person, ensuring they get the training they need, and then ensuring that they get that young person as an employee because they want to. So I'm on the board of an organization called Year Up. Take a look at it, Google it. And it, they're in six cities now. The whole mission of Year Up is to close the opportunity divide. It's based on an apprenticeship model. The young people in our program, after six months of training, go into jobs making $50,000 a year in finance and in high tech, because we're very strategic about what we're preparing them for, and it's heavily supported by industry. So there are models out there that I think are very effective that you could learn from. 
I completely agree with what you were saying about there needs to be a grassroots sort of bottom-up approach to reforming schools that we really can start you know, without waiting for the right elected person. But coming from the background of a student of MPA, my question <laughs> to you is how, what suggestions would you have for the legislators in the room, for the people who want to become part of the public sector in the room? How can the top help the bottom? How yeah. can that environment <laughs> that's that's a great question and that would be ideal it really would and, and you're right we do have two uh, uh, legislators in the room and and if they if they were able and I was just told by one that that you actually have a nonpartisan legislature right where uh, so so theoretically at least <laughs> theoretically at least uh, it shouldn't be that the partisanship is what prevents you from doing what needs to be done to serve the children so the, the, I, I would say the key is to use the evidence of what works to guide policy. That's not what we do right now. Right? I, I, I try to uh, explain that to a lot of my colleagues in academia who do policy work. I say, you know what? Policy is not based on research. It's based on either what's politically expedient or what's ideologically possible at any particular moment in time. However, every once in a while, <laughs> And this is where political savvy comes in. If you are able to build coalitions around a good idea, how did Oklahoma get so many kids in preschool in a very red state? Right? Well, they worked on it for many years, and they're sticking with it. <laughs> I, I wonder what they're thinking now, because Obama likes it too. They might say, well, forget preschool, you know? <laughs> if Obama likes hopefully not, right? But I, I think that there is a way to, to, to again, um, to organize, because if you could get the support at that level, at the level of state government, for what you're trying to do in your communities, it'll make a huge difference for getting resources there. Um, and I would say, look at the evidence. That's why, you know, if, if dual language is getting good results here in Omaha, we should get funding to do more of that in other places, right? And we should, you know, these, these building clinics into schools and extended learning. Here's a, there's a 6,000 hour gap right now, <laughs> on average, between low-income children and middle-class children in learning. What do poor kids do in the summer? What do middle-class kids do in the summer? Go to camp, right? <laughs> Travel, right? Well, guess what? That impacts learning. We could close that gap. We could do so much to begin to expand opportunities if we put the resources in places where we could have the impact. Suppose the state legislature decided, guess what, public universities? I see the, the chancellor, vice chancellor just left, so I can say this without him getting upset. If you want more money, <laughs> we want to see some concrete evidence you're helping Omaha schools, right? In ways that have an impact, not just for service, service is wonderful, in solving problems. Solving problems. And, and, and we want, and, and again, you can use resources to get, to move people. So I would, I think there's a lot can be done if we really approach this as problem solving and get some of the politics out of the way. I think right now, I mean, you look at what's happening in Washington, it's so dis depressing. You know, countries faced with so many problems, and all they do is fight, fight, fight over everything, shut the government down. I mean, hopefully you can set a different kind of example here in the middle of the country. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, what can we do as students, like, we as students, what can we do to encourage our community to make a change? Sure. Oh, that's that's a great question because because uh, you are our future, right? And so I would say young people can do a lot to first of all to to get your parents involved, get the community involved, to support it. Say, look, we need your support for what we're trying to do. You also can do a lot to express what you need to the educators. A lot of times, the educators are not listening to the students. I would say in any school, you go to the students, they'll tell you what classrooms they're learning in or what classrooms they're not learning in. Right? And, and the students could, uh, could, could be, do a better job at articulating what their needs are and influence so, so that you are engaged in the process of improving and address, uh, the schools and addressing your needs. So, I, but that takes being organized to articulate those needs. I would encourage you to do some research. You've got some sociologists here. Do, a, do some survey research with your, with your, among students so it's not just a handful of you who have these ideas. You could say, this is collectively what we would like to see more of, what we are concerned about in our school, so that you can be engaged as, 
as, as a serious part of your community and exercise your voice. So you can do a lot, I think, to articulate those needs and interests. Is. He's working, but he still has a question. <laughs> it's a dual language teacher. All right. Hi, my question is, what's your opinion on Common Core? Mm. Because my opinion is that the students aren't prepared, and neither are the teachers. And it does nothing to, to address the poverty and inequality that the students are experiencing. So you know, this is a, a, another classic example of what's wrong with the way we make policy, right? So there's a, there's a gleam of a good idea there, right? A glimmer of a good idea. The idea behind the Common Core was we wanted to have higher standards that were all children, regardless of where you live, would be exposed to. So there's more rigor, more higher order thinking in the curriculum. That's a good idea. But what the policymakers don't get, the hard work, is preparing the teachers. <laughs> and if you don't prepare the teachers and give them a curriculum to use and make sure they're well trained and ready to deliver it, what happens? You get more failure. And so it's an idea that is a half-baked idea that's not being implemented very well in most places. New York State, to give you an example, decided they would assess the kids on the new standards before the kids were even prepared. Right? So what happened? You had kids stressed out and just failing in much higher numbers. So I'm not against the Common Core, but I'm very concerned about implementation. And I've, I've been arguing for a while that, you know, this is why I said what, but implementation is the key. How you do this is, is as important as what you think you're trying to do. Because uh, we have too many examples. You know, No Child Behind was, was, was created for the right reason. Right? We passed a law, and remember that No Child Behind was bipartisan. It was President Bush and Ted Kennedy as the chief architects of No Child Behind. And the original idea was we wanted evidence that all children, regardless of their backgrounds, were learning. And in Kennedy's original vision of that bill, it was going to include health and other kind of supports. It was not simply about testing. However, the only evidence that we, keep, that we look at now is how well they do in our standardized test. And so all the other things that we know matter have been ignored. And so we have to be careful with these new policies that we think through all the other pieces that need to go into having the impact. That's the reason why I say look at Canada. Canada has a capacity building strategy that's working. And uh, we can learn from it. So thank you. Thank you.